All right, we just finished reading five verses, and uh, compared to some of our other passages that we've covered over the past few weeks, this is a relatively short passage of Scripture, but this is an extremely important passage of Scripture, so important, in fact, that in the Hebrew Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, these five verses are their own chapter. It's actually chapter three, and then chapter three becomes chapter four. And I don't know if you realize it or not, but as I was studying and meditating on this passage, praying over just a way to introduce this, to me, especially for the believer, the five verses that we just read are like a roller coaster ride. All right, that's kind of why we we had you ask the question, are you ready for this? I mean, you you start off and you climb that hill. You know, you're riding a roller coaster, you climb the top of that hill. And we start off on a high note. He's saying, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters are going to prophesy. Your old men are going to dream dreams. Your young men are going to see visions. I mean, you're on a high note, and you get to the top of that hill on that roller coaster, there's a nice view up there. And then all of a sudden, we had a sharp transition to the great and terrible day of the Lord. The sun's going to be turned into darkness. The moon's going to be turned into blood. And it's just like, man, you're on that roller coaster, and you drop, and you go through some crazy twists and turns, and you get flipped upside down. And the older you get, when your head starts shaking back and forth, you get a little bit lightheaded and dizzy. And then all of a sudden, you get to the end of that roller coaster. You come out of that last little tunnel, that last little flip, or whatever the case may be. And then all of a sudden, the brakes just slam on, right? And then the first thing everybody does is like laughs and breathes a sigh of relief. And that's, that, to me, that's verse 32. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. All right, so these five verses, they're, they're, they're short compared to the whole rest of the Bible, but there is a whole lot packed into these. And the title of the message this morning, and now what I want you to do too, is I want you to look at that same person that you just asked, are you ready for this? And I want you to answer back to them and say, I'm ready for anything, okay? <laughs> Go ahead, tell them. All right, so here's the question. Are are you really ready for anything? Are we really ready for anything? What does it mean to be ready for anything? Here's what it means to be ready for anything. It's a state where you are prepared for whatever is happening around you. You accept the opportunities that life gives you without underestimating or overestimating them. And you understand that, that God has given us his word so that we will prepared for what we will be prepared for whatever life throws our way. And he doesn't want us to overestimate, but he also doesn't want us to underestimate us. He's given us his word so that we can truly be prepared for whatever it is that life throws our way, for whatever it is that we have to face as we go through life. And Joel, the whole book of Joel really just brings this to life, but especially this chapter. Last week, anybody remember last week? Anybody remember yesterday? Anybody remember what you did two minutes ago, okay? A whole week ago, a lot happens in the course of a week, but but last week, we ended on a high. I mean, the, the, the story of Joel had been building to that point. I mean, we talked about the immediate day of the Lord with the locust crisis. We talked about the imminent day of the Lord with the, the threat of the enemy invasion. And the people responded to the message of Joel. They repented. They rent their hearts. They got right with God. And as a result, God in his graciousness and his mercy and in his loving kindness says, I'm going to respond to you. And you know what he said? I'm going to send the rain. It's going to rain again. Your barns are going to be filled again. And I love how he said, I'm going to restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. All of those wasted years, all of that time that you don't think you can get back. I have a way of multiplying that fruitfulness. I have a way of increasing my presence in your lives so that everything that you think you've lost and everything that you think you've wasted, that's just a lie. I can restore it all back to you. And all God's people said, and all God's people said, (laughs) Man, that's a high, right? It would be, in one sense, it would be nice, and that's how a lot of movies end, if the book just stopped right there. But it doesn't. It it, it drastically changes and moves forward in a different direction, and we end up here with verses 28 through 30. and, And the way that I see this is to keep any type of apathy... Because I I believe that's what led the children of Israel to where they were. They they just became apathetic. They stopped seeing the big picture. They stopped living for God. And they stopped realizing that he put them in this world for a mission and for a purpose. And they just became consumed with their lives and their own way of living and the things that they wanted to get out of their life. And in order to keep any type of that apathy from creeping back in, Joel is now going to go to the ultimate day of the Lord to remind us. 
One day we're going to stand before the judge of all of the earth. One day we're going to give an account. One day he's going to come back. And every single wrong that is happening in this world, he's going to make it right. Nobody's going to escape. Every wrong's going to be punished. The king of all the earth is going to judge. He's coming back. He's returning. And we as his people need to remember that we need to live on mission. And these five verses are from God just as much to us today as they were to the children of Israel back then, and they will truly help us to be ready for anything that life throws our way. Now, before I jump into the message, the first point is a question, okay? Before we get to the book of Joel, and I, I want to ask you this question. Are we living in the last days? Are we living in the last days? Okay, I'm going to take up a quick poll. I want to see where you all are at of this. How many of you would say, yes, we are living in the last days? Who puts their hand up? Who says, I don't know. It's hard to tell. I can't really be sure if we're living in the last days. How many of you are right there in the middle, kind of like that? How many of you think this is a completely trick question, and I'm just, you're going to know the answer, and it's going to be easy? All right, a couple of you right there. All right, so if you raised your hand, and you're confident, and you're convinced that we're living in the last days, I want you to answer this silently in your head. How do you know that? How are you so confident that we are actually living in the last days? I want you to get your answer. I want you to get your mind wrapped around that. And then I'm going to tell you the answer because the Bible tells it clearly. And I, I just want you to do that because I, I want to make sure that what you're thinking is actually what the Bible says. All right, so we know for a fact that the answer to the question that are we living in the last days is an emphatic yes. Because the Bible tells us that we're living in the last days. Go ahead and put Hebrews chapter 1, 1 and 2 up on the screen. I think you should have those back there ready to go. Hebrews chapter 1. Verses 1 and 2, okay. Look at what this says. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, that's what we're looking at here in the book of Joel, go to verse 2, hath in these, everybody help me out, what's it say? Last days spoken unto us by his Son. The last days began with Jesus Christ. So we're living in the last days. In these last days, he's spoken to un, unto us by his son. Go ahead and put 1 Corinthians up there on the screen as well. I want to show you another passage. There's multiples. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Look what it says. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples. And they are written for our admonition. And then everybody read the end of that verse with me. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. Paul's writing this to the church at Corinth 2,000 years ago, and he's saying, you're the people who the ends of the world have come upon. So that makes us still the people who the ends of the world have come upon. We are truly living in the last days. When Jesus came to earth 2,000 years ago, he came extending the kingdom of God, and the end of the age came with him. Remember when Jesus shows up, you can go find it in Matthew 4. You can find it at the beginning of, of all the Gospels after he's baptized. One of the first things that he says is the same thing that John the Baptist has been saying. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God came with Jesus. The end of the age came with Jesus. But to everybody's shock and surprise, the kingdom didn't fully arrive. And the end of the age didn't fully come. But what did arrive with Jesus and what did come with Jesus was a new period in salvation history. And that's what we are living in today. We are living in the last days. We are living in the days of grace and mercy where the Spirit of God can be poured out on all flesh. And the five verses that we are going to be looking, the five verses that we're going to be examining today, they look ahead to the last days. And they tell us that, that these are going to be days of powerful witness these are going to be days of terrible suffering, but they're also going to be days of salvation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. And we get done with this. You're going to see that if we follow what God's word says, we truly can be ready for anything. So let's just dive right in. Here's point number one, ready for anything. How can we be ready for anything? Because I've got the power. I've got the power. I almost thought about just giving you a little sound bite of that song because I can't say that phrase without that popping into my mind, but I'll just leave that alone, okay, for you today. But I've got the power. Look at verses 28 and 29. It says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon, what are those next two words? All flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. 
and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. God wanted to give them something far greater than physical blessings. He also wanted to give them spiritual blessings. In context, remember we talked about the rain is coming. And he's going to restore to all of them the wasted years. But he says, better than my physical blessings and better than, than, than physically being able to see how I can bless you. I want to give you something greater. I want to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters, your old men and your young men. Hey, your servants and your handmaidens. The spirit of God is available to young and old. It's not gender specific. It's not class specific. It's available to all flesh. Now, this is huge. I don't want you to miss this. If you were one of the original hearers of what Joel is saying, this, this would be shocking. And this would honestly be almost very hard to compute or very hard to understand. Because you have to understand in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God was only given to a few selected people to accomplish specific tasks. And he would come upon them for a while, but he wouldn't stay and he wouldn't remain. He would leave them. The Old Testament talks about several different examples. I mean, the Spirit would come on judges. It would come on warriors. It would come on prophets. It would come on kings. And even sometimes craftsmen. It talked about back in, um, uh, in the book of Leviticus. It came on a craftsman so that he would have the skill and knowledge to be able to make some of the vessels, beautiful vessels for the tabernacle. And so the Spirit of God would go on a few select individuals for a specific task, and then he would leave. He could come and go and he could leave like that. That's how it worked in the Old Testament. Here's what I want you to do. Imagine, just, just put yourself in that type of a setting. Imagine, just imagine if the Holy Spirit of God truly was available to all flesh. Moses imagined this. This, this helped me this week. I, I love this story. It just kind of puts all of this in context. In Numbers chapter 11, you want to talk about how real the Bible is, man. The Bible is real, it's interesting, and it is good, all right? So Numbers chapter 11, the children of Israel, they're, they're out in the wilderness, they're headed towards the promised land, and they are complaining. They are complaining, they're complaining so bad. The, the chapter starts very intensely. It starts like this. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them. How many of you agree that's a pretty severe consequence for complaining right there? The next time your kids complain, go to Numbers chapter 11, <laughs> verse 1, and tell them this is what might happen. No, okay, don't really do that, but you understand. God, God's angry. So Moses intercedes, he prays, and, and the fire stops. But the people are, you ever get such a bad attitude? You ever get so deep in your darkness that, like, even when serious things start happening and you just still can't snap out of it. Anybody ever been there before in your life? It's kind of where the children of Israel were. They, they still complain. They're complaining because in Egypt they had fish and cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic. I got to just tell this real quick story. It just came to my mind. This, this weekend my wife was gone at the ladies retreat. So dinner was up to me. I thought I was just going to order pizza, but my kids are like, we don't want pizza. So I made smash burgers. I did a really good job, too. I made a really good burger. And we're sitting there eating dinner, and I'm like, kids, how how'd I do? And they're like, the burger's pretty good. I was like, what's missing? And, and one of them was like, pretty much everything, Dad. Pretty much everything. I mean, we had good taste in burgers, and we had a bag of frozen french fries. That's what we ate. And they're like, when mom's here, we have guacamole, we have a special sauce, we have potatoes. And then she puts it in these things, and it looks all pretty. And I'm like, I am not your mom, okay? We're in the wilderness when she's gone, all right? Just be happy for what you got. I mean, that's kind of where we were at. So they're thinking about all the extras that they had. And they're like, if only we were back in Egypt. And you know what they're saying? If only we were slaves again. Do you understand how rotten our perspective can get? How, how quickly it can go downhill. That, that's what they're doing. And then they're complaining, all we have is this manna. We just have this bread. I mean, Psalms calls manna angel food. I mean, every single day they woke up and God provided for them. He gave them exactly what they needed to sustain them. They should have been amazed that every day they went out and a miracle of God was taking place right in front of them. But nope, they got bad attitudes. They're complaining. Well, the Lord is angry. And when he's angry, it's a righteous anger. It's not, a, it's not an indignant anger like we as people. He's angry. And so is Moses. 
this is the part that I really love. Go read through Numbers chapter 11 on your own sometime. You will see this. I'm paraphrasing just a little bit, but Moses basically says, why have you afflicted me with these people? Did I give birth to them that I should carry them like babies into the promised land? I mean, that's exactly what he says, basically. I paraphrase it just a little bit, but that's what he's saying. I didn't conceive them. I didn't give birth to them. The burden is too heavy for me. And God says, okay, Moses, I hear you. When we cry out to God, he hears us. And he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take some of that spirit that's upon you, and I'm going to get 70 elders, call them out from among the people, and I'm going to take some of that spirit that's upon you, I'm going to place it on them. And that's exactly what happened. He brings them before the people. The spirit of God comes down in a visible way. All 70 of those men start prophesying. Well, here's what really gets interesting, too. 68 out of the 70 stop. And they go back to their tents, but there's two people that remained in the middle of the camp, and they're continuing to prophesy. And Joshua comes up to Moses and says, command them to stop. Make, make them stop. They're, they're still prophesying. It's too far. And Moses, and maybe he's still just a little bit tainted himself, but he says, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Moses is imagining how different life would be, how wonderful life would be if God's spirit was readily available and every single person could experience it. I mean, wouldn't that change everything? Shouldn't that change everything? The answer to that is yes. Hey, fast forward to the book of Acts. You don't have to turn there, but in Acts chapter 2, there's a group of 120 people. This is about 50 days after Jesus rises again from the grave. They're in the upper room. They are praying, and they are waiting for the Holy Spirit. And after 50 days, he comes upon them. And he comes upon them in great power. I mean, it's visible and it's evident. And they go out from the upper room, and they start prophesying. They start preaching the gospel. And they're doing it in such a way that, that people are looking at them, and they're like, are these people drunk? They were so completely overtaken by another spirit that, that people are wondering if, the, if they're drunk and if they're out of their minds and they're preaching and everybody's hearing it in their own language. The Holy Spirit's doing an incredible work. 3,000 people get saved that day and Peter gets up and he stands before all the people and he says, men and brethren, these people are not drunk. What's happening today is exactly what Joel told us was going to happen we're living in the last days, and the Spirit of God is being poured out on all flesh. That's what's happening. The Spirit that has overtaken them is not a drunken spirit. It's not some false and fake eye. It is the Holy Spirit of God, and he's here to stay, and he's here to work, and he's here to do incredible things in people's hearts and in people's lives. And here's the practical application from all of this. Become all that you can be. We've got the power of the Holy Spirit of God. You understand? He's poured out on all flesh to all who call on the name of the Lord. We have the Holy Spirit of God. He comes and he indwells inside of us. He's available to us. He doesn't just come and stay for a little bit. No, we can be filled with all the Holy Spirit of God. And our responsibility is to become all that you can be. Look back at verse 28. I want you to see some of the specifics of what Joel said. He said, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And then he gets specific and he says what? And your who? Your sons and your, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. He said, when the Holy Spirit gets poured out on all flesh, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. They'll, they will be prompted by God to speak the right word at the right time in the right way. God teaches us through this book right here, and when we're in this book, and when we allow him to fill us, he gives us the right words at the right times, and we're able to speak them in the right way. Hey, then he says, next, he, after that, he says, um, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And then he says what? Your old men shall dream dreams. You know what he's talking about here? He's talking about hope-filled seniors, Older people that still have a vision about all that God can do in our world and how he can work. And then he says, and he ends that verse, and he says, your young men shall see visions. He's talking now to, to young people who are mission focused. Hey, we played that video. I, I want to tell you, here's some exciting news. On October 13th, um, 
Brother Gormley, he's the one that founded that whole ministry over there and pastors the church that then eventually started. The, he's going to be here, and then his daughter is going to be here, and his daughter is the one that had the vision for the orphanage and also for the transition home. So they're going to be here on October 13th. They can't wait to come here and meet y'all and thank us for the part that we get to play in that project. And I mention that because there's a young lady who started dreaming dreams and having a vision about what God can do, mission-focused. I'm not going to live for the things of this world. I'm going to live for something bigger and greater. Become all you can be. I I saw this quote, and it was so good. The same gym membership can get you abs or keep you fat. You ever notice that? The same gym membership, let that sink in. Are you all with me here this morning? The same gym membership can either get you abs or it can keep you fat. It all depends on what you do with it. I think that gyms love January because, man, those New Year's resolutions go out and people sign up. But then comes like one week later and they bail out. But all that money keeps coming in. It all depends on what you do with it. I just want to go back over this. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Children, where, where's all of our children? Where's everybody that, and sorry if you're like 17, I'm not trying to call you, you are a young adult, but everybody under the age of 18, where are you at? Slip your hands up so we can see you. I love the amount of young people that are here in our services. And just so this message doesn't go in one ear and out the other and we quickly forget what it is that we're talking about. Children, you, you, you that just raised your hands, you can prophesy. You can speak the right word at the right time in the right way. Paul tells Timothy, let no man despise your youth. You don't have to fall for the lies of this world and wait till you go out and live foolishly during your teenage years and then get to 25 and all of a sudden you're gonna clean it up and act straight. No, you can start now. God's got plans for you as a child. And by the way, some of the times our kids, they speak a whole lot of truth that mom and dad need to hear sometimes. You ever been called out by your kid and you're like, oh boy, you are right and I am wrong. And I know, listen, This truth of God's word provides wisdom. Shepherd's laughing because he does that to me all the time, and he's right a lot. I'll admit it, okay? But children, listen. I think about parents. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Think about the hope that should come to us as moms and dads. Sometimes we're like the children of Israel. We're just complaining, and man, this world is tough, and you got technology, and there's temptations all around. How are our kids ever going to end up living for God? I'll tell you what, if we're defeated, there's, there, we have a lot less of a chance. But if we're filled with faith, and we get up every day, and we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, and we believe in God's word, and even if our kids are wondering, and they're not seeing it, if we never lose faith, and if we don't give up, and if we stay filled with the Spirit of God, and we stay praying, and we stay living right before them, who knows what God's going to do with that, and who knows how he can get a hold of their hearts and their lives. I think of old men and women. Do any of you know any older people that it just seems like as you get older, you, you begin to lose that filter just a little bit on life? Anybody ever? Come on, where's my older people? Any of you just said, well, admit, I've lost that filter a long time ago. I go back and forth. I'll be honest. When, this is when I'm in my flesh. When I'm in my flesh, I go back and forth with this. Sometimes I'm like, I start taking notes of things that I promise myself I'm not going to do as I get older. And then other times I'm just like, I've earned the right to say whatever I want to say, however I want to say it. <laughs> Sometimes you start feeling that way in the flesh. But this verse tells us something completely different. We can be filled with the Spirit of God. You know what our world's in desperate need of? Older people with all of the life experience that God has given you that are filled with hope and faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't look at the next generation and say we're hopeless. No, you look at the next generation and you say, they were created for such a time as this, and you step into it and you breathe into them, and you help them to see the lessons that you've learned, and you inspire them with hope and with faith for the future. Do you dream dreams? God can do great things in our young people. I believe that with all my heart. And to our young people, Get serious about life. I was reading something to me that was tragic yesterday. It was, it was about the nuns, the people that, that don't claim any religion. And the majority of them, the vast majority of them, they walk away from religion between the ages of 15 and 25 years of age. One of the number one reasons why they walk away from religion is because of hypocrisy. And the most crucial age that they walk away from religion is at the age of 18. And I'm just thinking about that. 
And I'm thinking about how different life can be. And and my heart breaks because there's so many young people that go out and make mistakes and have to experience life and learn it the hard way. Can I tell you, if you're in that age group today, pay attention to what this verse is saying. You, You can see visions, get mission focused, recognize that there's nothing that this world or this life has to offer you that's better than what God has to offer you, that can satisfy you and fulfill you. Only God can. And get inspired and get dreams and start dreaming and imagining about how God can use you and what he's created you for and what he's put you here in this world to do because the Holy Spirit of God has been poured out on all flesh. What are we doing with him? Are we that different? Man, we are so hard and we are so critical sometimes on that generation of the children of Israel that came through, that left Egypt and went to the promised land because they were such complainers. We have better than what they have. We have the Holy Spirit of God. Shame on us if we don't do anything with him. Become all you can be. So we have the power. We can be ready for anything because we have the power. We can be ready for anything because we know what's coming. I know what's coming. All right, Everybody say that out loud. I know what's coming. We know what's coming. Look at verses 30 and 31. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Guess what? Dark days are ahead. How many of you believe that? Dark days are coming. Dark days lie ahead of us. The Bible tells us that the sun's going to be turned into darkness, the moon's into blood, the earth is going to experience natural catastrophes, powerful acts of God, war famine, death, and destruction. We're going to talk more specifically about this next week in chapter 3. I mean, chapter 3 goes into more detail about that great and terrible day of the Lord. Each revelation of God, all all through the years, the, the ways that God shows himself, the natural acts of God, each revelation of God prepares the way for another and another until we get to that last revelation, that great and terrible day of the Lord. Dark days are coming. Things will get worse. But here's what we so often forget and what we leave out. Things will get worse and they will get better. There's reason to hope in the last days. There's not reason just to throw up our hands and be discouraged. Things will get worse and things will get better. Jesus told us how to prepare for the last days in Matthew chapter 24. Even in the worst of the last days, in the period of the most intense tribulation, listen to what he says in verse, chapter, Matthew 24 verse 6. He says this, And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. And you know know what he tells his people? See that you be not troubled. All those wars and rumors of wars. You turn on the news. See that you be not troubled. That's not my words. That's God's words. We're ready for anything. We know what's coming. Nothing should be shocking. Nothing should be taking us by surprise. All right? So see that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. And then he says this. Nation's going to rise against nation. We know about that. You always are hearing about wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be famines and earthquakes. Then he says this. I mean, I thought he just told them might be not to be troubled, but then he says this. Then they will deliver you up and put you to death. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. I'm sorry, those are not, like, that verse does not get me that excited, if I'm being honest. That's not something that I'm, I'm easily ready to embrace, but he tells us again, there's going to be a coming of death. We're going to experience persecution for our faith. They're going to deliver you up and put you to death. You're going to be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then he says this, many are going to fall away and betray one another. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Lawlessness will be increased. Just that spirit of disobedience and anything goes, it's going to be increased. And then it says, and the love of many will grow cold. He's talking about believers, professing believers, There's going to be a turning away, a falling away inside of the church, inside of people that are supposed to be God's people. But then comes one of the most hopeful verses in the entire Bible, and it's this. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. You know what he's saying? Jesus is not ultimately going to return until the gospel of the kingdom is preached in the entire world. So here's the practical application from all of this. I know what's coming. Belong to the cloud of witnesses. 
belong to the cloud of witnesses. Yes, it's true that inside the church there will be a falling away. And maybe those aren't ever truly professing Christians. Maybe there's people that, that profess Christ. Maybe they don't really know him with all their heart. But there will be a turning away from God. There will be many false prophets that arise on the scene. But guess what else there's going to be that we so often leave out? There's going to be another group of believers that get so on fire for God in their passion and their zeal for God that nothing will stop them, not the face of persecution, not the threat of death. And they go out and they lift high the name of Jesus and they proclaim Jesus to the ends of the earth where the gospel reaches every single corner of this world for God's honor and for God's glory. And guess what else happens? People get saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. A great revival happens. Go read Revelation. There are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of saints, of people that are saved during the great tribulation of God before he comes back. And so often we leave that out and we forget about it. Yes, things will get dark. Yes, dark days lie ahead. But there is hope and there is peace and there is salvation in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know what group I want to be a part of? I don't want to fall away. I don't want to be cold. I don't want to be apathetic. We can join sides right now. There's no reason that this church can't be a church that is red hot in their passion and zeal for God. There's no reason that we can't prophesy. You know what prophecy is? It's just a bold witness. It's saying the right words at the right time in the right way. And it's based on the truth that we know of God. And it's inspired and led by the Holy Spirit. And if he's working in us and through us, there's no stopping what he wants to do with that. Can I ask you this morning, has God been good to you? Is Jesus, has, look, has Jesus changed your life? I mean, has he truly, just think about that. How has he changed your life? Has everything been turned upside down for the better because of what Jesus has done? Man, is he speaking to you through his word? Is he drawing you to himself? Man, I wish I had time. Next week is Baptism Sunday. I can't wait. We got, I think, somewhere around 10 right now. It keeps fluctuating a little bit. We got 10 people that are going to publicly profess Christ. And I'm telling you, God is at work. The Holy Spirit is at work drawing people to himself. He's doing incredible things in people's hearts and lives. He's speaking to you and transforming you and changing you through God's word. Alana came home with so many testimonies from the ladies retreat about what God's doing in your heart and in your life. Take that and don't lose sight of that and breathe into that and respond to that. And then go out and just tell the world the great things that he's done for you. Tell your neighbors, tell your coworkers, tell your family members, get on fire for God. Ask him not to let that fire burn out and leave you. Belong to that great cloud of witnesses that in the face of the greatest persecution and threats, it's not going to stop them because even death can't stop us because the second we breathe our last breath, we're delivered and we're saved because we see Jesus Christ face to face. Man, we know what's coming. Belong to the cloud of witnesses. And the last thing, and we're done, I will be saved. We can be ready for anything because we've got the power. We know what's coming, and I will be saved. Let's all say that out loud together, and let's say it like we mean it, okay? Everybody, here we go. I will be saved. All right, look at verse 32. And it shall come to pass. Everybody read that next line with me that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. The last days should hold no terror and no fear for God's people. There's no surprises. I mean, he's laid it out about as point blank and as emphatic as it possibly can be laid out, right? So you're going to be hated. By the whole world for my name's sake. I mean, just be ready for it. But we don't need to be terrified and we don't need to be fearful of it. I'm not saying we need to be frivolous about it. I'm just saying we should be ready and we should be prepared. And the reason why it can hold no terror is because whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And guess what? I called on the name of the Lord. I know that I'm going to be saved. I was eight years old. 
It was on a Sunday night after church. The pastor was preaching on hell. I was scared. I went home and talked to my mom and dad. But I remember that night getting on my knees and calling on the name of the Lord, asking Jesus to save me, giving my life to him. I never forgot that night. I remember kneeling at the back of my mom and dad's bed and praying with my dad and trusting Jesus as my savior. And I know that no matter what life throws my way, even if it's my last breath, the second I breathe it, I will be delivered. I'll be saved. How many of you know that? With confidence this morning. Man, do you have that same kind of confidence? Here's the last practical application, and we're done. Believe on Jesus. This series that we're in is believe, belong, become, believe in Jesus and his transforming power. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord, every single Sunday, I ask everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. And then I say, I, I pretty much say it verbatim. You all hear it a week after week after week. And I'll say, I'm about to ask you the most important question that anybody's ever going to ask you in your life. Do you know for sure that you have a relationship with God? Now, what I'm not talking about, it's not a head knowledge. A lot of people, we've been running into the multiples of people lately from the time that you're born, you, you almost can't even remember not knowing about God or knowing who he is. And we live in America, and I thank God for America, and I thank God for the Christian influence that has been in America. And there's hard pressed to find a person that doesn't know that Jesus was born at Christmas, that he died and rose again at Easter. But that head knowledge isn't enough to save. Just because we know that with our heads and we know the story, that's not what saves us. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There, there's got to be that point of crisis in your life, that, that moment of time where everything intersects and it all come, becomes clear and it makes sense. I'm a sinner. I'm broken. <laughs> I heard this testimony recently. I think someone just shared it about like just being surprised that church people are broken. If you're here this morning and you're visiting, okay, and you think church people got it all together, that is the biggest lie that's ever been told. <laughs> We're far from perfect. We're broken people. I don't have to convince you of that. But in our brokenness, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin, the payment for our sin is death. And guess what happened on the cross? Jesus died. The punishment for sin was death. And on the cross, he died. He took your place. He took my place. And then he says, believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. It's more than just a head knowledge. Again, repentance has to do with like a, a genuine you're going this way, but it's a turning. And, and, and calling on the name of the Lord has to do with the right faith. The only way that I'm going to get to heaven is through Jesus. There's no other way to heaven. It's only through Jesus and what he did for me on the cross. It has to do with the right trust. You know what's awesome when you put your faith and trust in Jesus? Oh, I love this. This is so good. When God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Your sins and your past and your guilt, it's forever erased. It's forever removed. Because when you put your faith in Jesus, you're trusting in Jesus. And you're trusting in his righteousness, not in your righteousness. And there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You're not getting beat up for your past any longer because he saved you. And when God sees you, he sees Jesus. And that's one of the most transforming things. So it's only in Jesus. And your trust is in Jesus. Calling on the name of the Lord, repent, it involves the right kind of devotion. We don't just look at a God like that, and we don't just look to the cross and say, thanks a lot, I really want to be saved, thanks for dying for me, and then we just turn around and go right back our own way. What was it that led you to Jesus anyway? An emptiness? A brokenness? A void that's in your heart and in your soul? No, man, when you turn to Jesus... And you turn to that cross and you see that he died for you and you see that he took your place and you see it's his righteousness that's being imparted to you. How can we do anything but devote our lives and say, here's my life, you can have it, you can use it in any way that you see fit and you give your life to Jesus and now you're in a new path and a new direction, going a new way. That's what calling on the name of the Lord is all about. That's how we know for sure that we have a relationship with God. And listen, you may not have understood all of those things at that moment, but if you think about it, they were probably all there. You ever get brought to tears just thinking about Jesus' sacrifice and the fact that your sins are forever erased? <laughs> My heart still soars with joy and excitement when I think about that. 
You ever just have something burning inside of you that says, I just want to learn more about Jesus. I just want to know more about him. I want to get in his word because it speaks to me, because he's alive and because he's real. That's what it means to call on the name of the Lord. And guess what? It doesn't stop the moment we get to every day. I got to get up and keep calling on him. I got to keep putting my faith and my trust and giving him my life and surrendering. And the more that I do, the more that he pours out his spirit and the more that he blesses and the more powerful the witness is and the more other people can see him in our lives and the more we're satisfied and the more we're fulfilled and the more we're filled with faith and the more we are warriors for Christ that our world is in desperate need of. Believe in Jesus and his transforming power. 